Across the West, and in particular in Northern California, where complex fire behavior mirrors our rugged topography, we need to learn how to relate to fire again. The importance of fire can't be overstated um, as a management tool to manage these landscapes, and uh, the same has been true for thousands of years. Fires were very frequent in these forests. Fire would come back again and again and again. The 2012 fire season has been a potent reminder of what's at stake. Hundreds of homes and many lives have already been lost in our failed but seemingly unavoidable battle with wildfires across the country. A century of fire suppression on national forests, coupled with logging and development where communities meet the wild ones, have made fire suppression an increasingly dangerous and costly pursuit. The Smoky Bear has done an excellent job um, preventing wildland fires and saying fire is bad. Well, now we're in this realm where we realize that the ecosystem needs fire. What we've done is we've, we've swapped out almost all of our historical low severity fire regime to mixed and high severity fire regimes. So now we can go in and we can see patches where 5,000 acres at a swath all burn with high severity. And that was never a precedent in the historical forests. The longer we go without treating areas with fire, the longer we go without burning areas, the more complex this, you know, the whole enterprise becomes. Fire scientists have well documented the impacts of fire suppression and how it has set the stage for recent mega fires. Managers know they need to restore these fire-dependent ecosystems, but face significant challenges in getting fire back on the ground. It's maybe not as polarizing as uh, same-sex marriage or abortion, but it definitely does kind of elicit those types of visceral reactions in people. Some people just don't think fire has a place in the landscape and that we should, we should manage it out of existence. You know, we just know from our understanding of ecology of the areas that that's pretty much impossible. We're now experiencing the rise of megafires across the West as fuel loading and climate change combine to overwhelm the most technologically advanced firefighting force in history. On a per acre basis, fire suppression is one of the most expensive land management activities we do. It's not sustainable. When I see $12 million being spent on one fire, I'm thinking $12 million, man, what could we do? What could we do with prescribed fire? Oh, man. The Kaduk tribe still occupies their aboriginal territory in the western Klamath Mountains, where they've been burning for thousands of years. The knowledge still exists on how, when, and why to burn. When you talk about a natural fire regime, Humans are a component of that regime. They, they, they can't be separated. Really, the last land management model that worked in this country was the tribal management model. Fire-prone communities across the country have jump-started local planning efforts to address the threat of wildfires through FireWise programs, prescribed fire councils, and fire safe councils. So folks like uh, the fire safe council, those are people who live here in these communities. Uh, they're here, they have a responsibility to this place too. A lot of the, the prescribed burns that we do, do have this multiple function of being uh, for reducing fuels, fuels around homes and on private property and, and maintaining the fuel breaks that we've created. But at the same time, we're focusing on areas where we might be, say, treating a tan oak stand like the one we're in right now so that we have better acorn crops in future years. These groups are linking the goals of rural communities with national fire policy. The National Parks in the West have been leaders in the use of prescribed fire for biodiversity conservation. A wildland fire burning into an area that's been treated with fire prescribed burn, uh, basically the intensities drop, turns into a low intensity fire, resources are able to uh, stop fire spread within those areas. 
Forest Service burn managers in Northern California are also using prescribed fire as a tool to protect communities. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a burned area around the communities so when a wildfire starts, maybe we can save some suppression dollars by falling back to the place that makes sense to fight that fire. We need to get the word out that um, in the absence of a controlled fire, you're going to have these large fires um, occurring. For nearly 70 years, the Smoky Bear ad campaign, while effectively spreading the message to prevent human-caused wildfires, has also cultivated our fear of all fires. This has made it difficult for people to distinguish between wildfire and prescribed fire. The Northern California Prescribed Fire Council is working to change that. A lot of people are concerned about fire and the lack of fire, um, and they all play roles in this, and I think that the, the organization has had really broad arms to bring those people in. Fire is not an option. We can't choose whether we're going to have fire on the landscape here or not. It's, it's here, it's, it's, part of the, it's part of the scene, it's part of the future. If someone thinks that, that prescribed fire is inherently too dangerous, you know, the, the other option is, is wildfire, which is inherently much more dangerous. We are well situated to provide a model for the rest of the country on what can be done, what can be done on a local level. Catching fire prescribed burning in Northern California. Beginning with the Weeks Act of 1911, new laws mandated that the recently formed U.S. Forest Service take on fire suppression as its primary goal, while at the same time outlawing controlled burning by Native Americans and settlers alike you read in some of the early correspondence from District Ranger here at Orleans trying to explain to his forest supervisor the difficulty and the challenges of trying to convince people that suppression was good for them when, as he says himself, when, when the proof is in their own eyes. To the contrary, what people witnessed with their own eyes was the negative consequences very quickly. I might add, very quickly. Part of the taming of the wilderness was um, getting, rid of, uh, <laughs> getting rid of the native people who um, stood in the way of progress, who, you know, who were occupying these lands. Um, and, um, and, you know, if you want to get rid of the native people, then, you know, it's a, a simple equation um, is you rob them of the resources necessary to survive. And in the case of on the, on the plains, it was the buffalo. Um, if you exterminate the buffalo, turns out we won't have this problem with um, the native people anymore. They'll be, you know, what, what ones are left will be easy enough to control and uh, put them on reservations, get them out of the way. Um, and out here, you know, you could, you could accomplish that by, you know, excluding fire. The people that need these plants burn and use them are the ones that are going to tell you what they need, when they need it. It is still essentially illegal for the Karuk people to do what they believe is their responsibility, to maintain balance in ecological processes, reducing the frequency of high-intensity fires. It's kind of difficult for me to understand that I could go out with two people in February and burn a 15-acre slope of buckbrush without having a fire line, and there's no chance it's going to escape, and it can maintain conditions that would reduce the risk to people that live right next to those. And knowing that I could go out there and do that, but if I did, I would go to prison, just is disturbing. Seeing uh, the policies of uh, excluding fire from the landscape and criminalizing our use of fire as a management tool has certainly been a, a huge detriment you know, to our people. Um, 
as well as a, a huge detriment to all of the things that depend on the natural world and this landscape. Um, it's not something that only affects uh, Indian people, for sure. Um, it affects every <laughs> every person uh, that depends on this landscape for for survival, whether they know it or not. The results of fire suppression have had a profound impact on forests shaped by natural and human fires. Pre-suppression fire scar evidence shows that fires return to most of these landscapes every five to 15 years. The first supervisor of the Trinity National Forest uh, said that most of the fires that we have on this forest are ground fires, and they oftentimes stop at trails. This suggests that, that these were flame lengths that were probably six inches to a foot. And the reason that they were so, so low flame lengths was because fire would come back again and again and again and uh, would leave the big trees unscathed because the big trees are the ones with the thick bark and the tall crowns. And so what it would do, it would, it would pretty much thin out the underbrush and the small trees so they're very open forest, and because of that, they were very fire resistant. So the historical low severity fire regime is, is kind of the, the kind of the poster child for fire as, as maintaining stable conditions, stable habitat for wildlife, for example. The other thing was that we came in, and particularly in the in the mixed conifer forest, we came in and we selectively logged the largest, most fire resistant trees. In the wake of this logging, Vast areas of dense second growth forests grew up in their place. Without fire on the landscape to thin them, a series of management issues were created. Because now we have these 1,000 to 5,000 acre patches of pure even aged forest coming up. What do we do with them? Well, the scale of the, of the need for fire is so vast. We, we have a, what's called a fire deficit. I mean, up until, up through the 30s or 40s, 1930s, 1940s, about 30 to 40 million acres burned here in the U.S. every year. 30 to 40 million acres. After World War II, uh, we reduced it down to about three to four million acres, a tenfold decrease. So that's every year we're accumulating a fire deficit. Lands that coulda, woulda, shoulda burned uh, didn't. And after World War II, with all the technology of, of the, the war being applied to fires, our war against nature was pretty successful, but it wasn't just the technology, it was the climate that was involved as well. By the 1970s, a shift to a drier and warmer climate, coupled with these dense fuels, spawned wildfires that were nearly impossible to control. The analogy <clears throat> that that folks use when discussing fire, wildfire management is, uh, is a, triage, a triage situation. You're in a battlefield and you have a list of what are the, what are the priorities and you address that, that the most emergent situation. Um, and, and so you end up with landscapes that are not burned the way you think they should be burned um, and with outcomes like very high severity fire and the high severity fire in many cases clearly linked to the way these fires were managed. Fire suppression in the U.S. costs taxpayers over a billion dollars every year. A large fire suppression industry now exists where private businesses nationwide are dependent on these large wildfires for their livelihood. It's not sustainable just spending uh, a billion or a billion and a half or more fighting fires uh, that are not budgeted and not accounted for. One way or the other, we're not going to be able to spend that same amount of money on, on fighting fires. The policy of fighting all wildfires costs taxpayers both in suppression costs and in the long-term impacts to the landscape. The Smoky Bear campaign is one of the largest public education campaigns in U.S. history. For many years, Smoky presented a simplified message that all fires in the forest were bad. Today the campaign has been updated and although the message is to prevent human-caused wildfires, many people associate his message with the idea that all fire is bad. You know, right here in, this, in these communities where my kids go to school, 
Um, you know, it seems like uh, every month or so, uh, my kids come home with little plastic bags filled full of Smokey the Bear stuff. Evidence that um, someone from the Forest Service has been in to visit the school. They continue the um, feeding the propaganda to this community and to all communities across the country. Um, and, and this is right now today I'm talking. Despite you know the scientific evidence saying, put the brakes on this thing, let's turn this bus around, we need fire back on the landscape. Um, the translation from that science, the science informing the management, is a huge disconnect. A century of fire suppression has fundamentally changed the nature of forested landscapes in the West. Change is needed or else we're gonna reach a threshold to where we're gonna start losing entire species populations. I mean, it's, it's already happening. It may take, you know, 900 years to get back to where it's doing what it did 100 years ago. But we can start that process. And we can start to educate people on understanding that there are misconceptions of the subject. A small but committed group representing diverse stakeholders are currently working to increase the use of controlled burning or prescribed fire as a management tool. Seasonal controlled burning provides many benefits at a low cost. From a biodiversity conservation standpoint, fire maintains habitats supporting the many varieties of flora and fauna we see in this area today. It promotes the health and abundance of valued natural and cultural resources and can protect communities from extreme wildfires. Working together at the community scale to reinitiate the purpose of humans and fire in that relationship um, is something that, that has to be done by the people who are going to be here for a long time. Because in order to truly understand and learn from what you're doing, it has to become an, an intergenerational process. You know, the people that live in these communities today, whether they're native or non-native, have a commitment to this, to this place. Um, and um, maybe they actually think they own something here. Maybe they paid money and purchased a piece of land, you know, nobody really owns anything. What you own is a responsibility. One group that has taken on this responsibility is the Orleans Soames Bar Fire Safe Council. The Orleans Soames Bar Fire Safe Council was formed in 2001 following the passage of the National Fire Plan. I was coming out of uh, Humboldt State University at that time and, and looking for a way to make a difference back here in the Salmon River, mid Klamath area, and realized this opportunity for us to organize around fire issues as a community. So after uh, several community meetings in 2001, um, we decided to formalize ourselves with a mission statement and a strategic plan for primarily protecting communities from the threat of wildfire, but also wrapped up in our mission statement was the understanding that that is tied to uh, restoring historic fire regimes. The planning area of the Fire Safe Council is primarily national forest lands, including 8,000 acres of private land along the middle section of the Klamath River. This area is within the aboriginal territory of the Karuk tribe. Really what kind of was the catalyst to our prescribed burning program was the science that came out and showed that a lot of home ignitions were happening after the flaming front had passed and uh, it was the creeping ground fire coming along in the duff that caught onto the siding that actually ignited the structure. And so right away we were treating fuels for a couple years, we could go back and look at those fuel breaks and see that a lot of our work was already being 
uh, covered up by regrowth. Um, and so that's what originally got us into looking at prescribed burning was maintaining our fuel brakes uh, so that they would function as fuel brakes in wildfires. I see the merit of fuel brakes, but not to put fires out, not to stop wildfire, but to put fires in, to start prescribed fire, or to manage wildfire with, with, with uh, fire use. And the kind of fuel brake it takes to start fires under the best of conditions for doing that and controlling it is, is less, uh, less harsh on the forest than the kinds of fuel brakes to stop a wildfire under the worst of conditions. In the seven years that we've been burning, we've accomplished about 400 acres. We're not even burning a tenth of what we should ecologically be burning in a year. The Fire Safe Council estimates this burning on private lands would cost approximately $320,000 per year. These costs would go down over time once the initial fuel buildup was dealt with. Evidence is that for each dollar you spend preparing for fire, either doing fire management planning or some kind of pre-fire uh, fuels or vegetation treatments, you save about seven dollars or more in fire suppression. So, you know, we're, we're spending our money at the wrong end of this, this situation. We, we should be spending more on the front end, helping homeowners prepare their homes for fire, because we know it's going to happen. Perry Daniels and P.D. Brucker are active members of their local fire safe councils. Both use controlled burns regularly to protect their homes from wildfires. Uh, when you live in a urban area, um, seeing smoke on the hillsides is always alarming. And uh, when you move up here to the country, when you're living on a wood pile, and you start lighting things on fire, you do feel a little apprehension. It was uh, quite an adrenaline rush when, it, when we first started burning here. Uh, I'm a little more used to it now. I'm much more comfortable with it, and I realize that you know, it, it's something that we need to do. If we want this property to survive a wildfire coming through, we have to put fire on the ground here. I remember one time when we first had our first fuels reduction project down here in 94, getting rid of the fuels all around there and down by the mailbox down there. We had gotten rid of it. And we worked for about four hours, actually. Worked for about four hours. We were getting rid of the fuels, and, and we got about half an acre. So we went for lunch, and I said, hey, guys, check it out. And there were eight of us. It was really good. You know, it was spring. So I just lit off. I just lit off a couple sections. Sure enough, in a half an hour, did better work than we did in, an, in four hours. Right now, we're going into places that haven't seen fire in 100 years, um, and having to do an extreme amount of fuels reduction, there's a lot of ground litter, there's you know a foot and a half thick duff layers in some areas, so we have to be extra careful. The problem we have right now, we've excluded fire from the ecosystem for so long that we need to put fire back into it, low intensity for the first entrance. And, and most burn managers go out there and burn the area one time. Okay, we got that done, and then they're gonna wait another 100 years, which you just lost the reason you needed to put fire in there in the first place. You've gotta follow up that burn with another burn. You know, if, if the area was, re, you know, fire history was every eight years, maybe you need to come back in there on the second burn three years later to clean up a lot of the dead stuff that you killed the first time and then come back in 10 years after that and that's when you're going to see some changes on the ground is after that third burn. These burns address the need for mixed severity fire to maintain ecological function. Well I think for a healthy ecosystem you've got to blow some holes in that canopy. You, you've got to get some diversity in your in your vegetation which means old growth versus new growth you've got to have some brush component and grass for for the species that rely on that areas to reintroduce prescribed fire on the landscape 
those areas that burned in 2008, the adjacent unburned areas are a perfect opportunity to do that. Some places probably have been reset to square one. Other places, the stage has been set to reset to square one in the next fire. If we wait till 2020 to go into those tan oak stands that burned in 2008, many of those are gonna reset to brush. You know, we could retrace these, these big fire years and you think about what to do with these landscapes now. And I think in the past, the, the um, direction that's been taken is, um, well, we'll plant these, we'll plant these forests. And I think that's a, um, I think in a lot of cases that's a knee-jerk response that, um, you know, that's not the strategy. This, the better strategy, and I think this gets back to the idea of prescribed fire, is that you embrace the disturbance of the landscape. You embrace the landscape. The landscape is, is going to burn, and so how might we design vegetation that can tolerate fire? Methods for reinstating historic fire regimes have come from the Karuk tribe, whose experience burning on this landscape for thousands of years is invaluable to community members. Ever since our formation, we've worked closely with the tribe to identify not just the areas that needed to be treated, but what types of treatments were specific to that vegetation type, to that slope, to that aspect, and and more importantly, what types of ecological processes were we affecting and what were the, the species that we might be impacting by implementing prescribed burns in different seasons. All the tribal perspective is, is, um, is, is based on a long history of science um, and this understanding that um, all things in this universe are connected. Um, we have uh, ceremonies that we practice, yes. What are those ceremonies based on? Those, they're not based on some, uh, you know, far out uh, weird concepts. They're based on survival in this place. I believe it was 1911, the last time Offield Mountain was burned as part of the World Renewal Ceremonies. When you look at that corner of the landscape and you look at if that was burned every year, then there's a large area where private residents today wouldn't have to worry about a threat of fire coming from the Marble Mountain Wilderness in July. You know, we have to work within this landscape. This landscape has to produce what we need it to produce so we can survive, so our children and grandchildren can survive and subsist here in a sustainable fashion. Northwest California is known for its basketry. We're world renowned for our basketry. And um, our knowledge of the plants and the fact that we have been here forever. We have always been here. And we will always be here. The fact that I'm sitting here talking to you right now is a testament to that because of what our people have gone through. Our knowledge of this landscape and the management practices that are tailored, that have been used for thousands of years, um, evolved from this place right here. Not someplace else, from this place. You can manipulate the vegetation to provide what you want and discourage what you don't want by setting those fires at different times of the year in different intensities. Um, what I brought to show you right here is some really nice sticks. These are hazel sticks. And these are um, what we've gotten from burned areas. When you have a hazel plant, for example, and it's, it grows and it grows, it just turns into a great big bush that's very unmanageable. If it was burned in the fall, back down to the base, what would come up in the spring would be these nice straight shoots. And I would be going and gathering those nice straight shoots. If it's not burned, it will always have these little side shoots that I can do nothing with. I cannot weave with things like that. The Karuk also use fire to reduce fuels in tan oak acorn gathering areas. Cultural burns in tan oak stands kill young fir trees that would eventually overtop the tan oaks in the absence of fire. These fires create clear understories that promote gathering, protect fire sensitive tan oak trees from wildfires, and produce an abundance of high quality acorns. 
Heat and smoke from these fires interrupt the life cycle of weevils and other pathogens that infect the acorns. The people nowadays, we pick a lot of acorns, uh, both for ceremony, but the older people, when they get sick and they can't eat anything, first thing they start asking for is acorns and deer meat and um, salmon. So they go back to their foods that they ate when they were younger, but foods that are nutritious. I can still go and pick acorns from my great-grandmother's tree. I know where it's at. And a lot of people can't say that. There's, there's kind of like two principles that I always come back to uh, in talking about these things. One is that when we talk about forest ecology and fire ecology, that it's a science of place, that the problems aren't the same everywhere and the solutions aren't the same in every place. It depends on what forest type that you're in. The second principle is, is that the only constant is change, which means that, that uh, forests are gonna change with or without disturbance. Fire is gonna be there whether you like it or whether you don't like it. Um, and so you're gonna have to live with the fact that fire is a part of the, the social environment as well as the natural environment. I think there are lots of um, opportunities in, in Northwestern California to, to use prescribed fire. Um, one of those clearly is in oak woodlands and grasslands. These are areas that burn from lightning ignitions. They burned a lot from, from tribal ignitions. Um, and they have, in many cases, have been burned quite a bit by federal and state agencies and just local private landowners who were interested in keeping these woodlands open. John McClellan has been the prescribed fire technician for Redwood National Park since 1985. His career began when the park started managing the bald hills with prescribed fire. After realizing these oak woodlands and grasslands needed fire to persist on the landscape. What's really cool after we, after we burn is, um, if it's a late season burn, there's already moisture in the ground is within three or four days after the burn you get a nice regrowth coming up of, of young grass and then you'll see the elk move right in to the grasslands and it's it's pretty cool to see you know wildlife utilize an area that was just burned um, and again that kind of ties in the whole historic role of, of Native Americans utilizing fire as a tool they certainly wanted to perpetuate elk and deer and, and as a food source, and they recognized that fire was a great way to do that. Um, you know, you burn off the dry grass, it rains, and immediately, you know, you have the green grass coming up through. You got the oak seedlings that then drop, you know, a great food source for the, the wildlife, and, you know, it's just, it's a great thing to see. You know, these low intensity burns, it burns through, and then it basically leaves the root system and the base of the plant intact so it can just re sprout and come back. So. It's, it's pretty neat to see. Most of the large legacy oaks all have fire scars, you know, from re repeated burning. One of the objectives is to kill Douglas fir, young Douglas fir seedlings, um, three feet and lower um, in open grasslands. Um, the Forest Service has been a little slower to, um, to think about um, ecosystem restoration, think about biodiversity conservation. They, they have been discussing it in words, but I think in their, as they apply it in the landscape, I think they've been a little bit slower. Modern forest management is still driven primarily by economics and is based on the European view of the forest as either a wilderness not to be touched or as a resource to generate profit. And the longer we go without treating areas with fire, the longer we go without burning areas, the more complex this you know, the whole enterprise becomes. I think that's part of it too. They've built a, a landscape that's a little bit harder to burn sometimes. Um, I have, I'm very optimistic for the Forest Service. In the spring of 2012, the Happy Camp Ranger District, with the support of tribal fire crews and local contractors, implemented a series of prescribed burns around the town of Happy Camp to protect the community from future wildfires. We could just completed about 450, 440 acres on this one unit. Uh, we've been burning since Monday afternoon. Uh, the resources, we've had three, four crews, um, three to five engines and miscellaneous overhead on the fire. We staffed the fire 24 hours a day. We had folks working um, all night long on this to make sure everything went real smooth. 
and we wanted to make sure that the town people, you know, the community knew that we were doing this safe and that, you know, it's going to do some good things. A few months after this burn, a large lightning storm in the middle of fire season produced several lightning strikes that hit snags within this burn area. Because the ground fuels were already consumed, these fires put themselves out. The Shasta Trinity has a proposal to uh, treat some strategic ridge lines in the Trinity Alps with prescribed fire. Some of these strategic ridge lines that might routinely be used for trying to hold uh, wildfires in the future. During the suppression of the 2009 Backbone Fire, tribes and forest supervisors discussed the need to use controlled burns to restore high country ridge systems as landscape level fuel breaks. This idea of aerial ignitions along ridge tops late in the season, you know, makes a lot of sense. Putting fire on our ridge systems in, in the fall after the peak of fire season, I think is one way that we can very cheaply and efficiently and quickly build some resiliency to the mega fires that, that we're likely to see in the climate change scenario. Fire managers face many challenges implementing controlled burns. These include the public's general fear of fire, irritation with smoke, increasing regulations and liability issues, and a growing concern for carbon emissions in a changing climate. By midsummer 2012, 1.8 million acres had been treated with prescribed fire in the U.S. 1.3 million acres of this total were burned in the southeast, while only 42,000 acres were burned in California. Some of the reasons the southeast does a lot more burning, they give liability insurance to any prescribed burn manager that's gone through the training and, and, and completed and is a part of their system. And so every time you get a burn permit, you are covered liability-wise, which is something that California and all these Western states do not have. And so with Florida, the nice part down there was the community, the laws, the people know that fire has to happen. And so with that, they want things burned. As a community here in uh, Northern California, we're afraid to use one of our most powerful tools. And so part of our work through the Fire Safe Council has been to kind of put the use of that tool safely back in the hands of, of the people. You know, once you learn about fire and you feel more comfortable about how fire works, who it is, what it is, uh, you can see that it can be good or bad. Uh, you have to understand how it works. Then your relationship fire can be more relaxed. P.D. Brucker began burning around his home on the Salmon River after losing two previous homes to wildfires in 1977 and 1987. Yeah, some people, some people think that I should be calloused about fire and that I should be, think it's really bad. Um, but that doesn't really open my mind and let me understand how it works, what fire is, because fire's not innately a bad thing. The frequency of escapes is very low, less than 1% of prescribed fires escape, but that 1% does stand out in people's mind. We do successfully treat a lot of acres with prescribed fire every year, and people only hear about the, the failures, and those are pretty few and far between. Lenya Quinn Davidson grew up in Hayfork, in the heart of Trinity County, a very fire-prone area of Northern California. She's the coordinator for the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council. For part of my master's thesis, I went back to Hayfork um, and interviewed people about their perceptions of prescribed fire. And I had planned, I'd taken, you know, over a year to plan this project and I was all geared up to go to Hayfork. And that was in June of 2008 <laughs> when, um, you know, lightning started thousands of fires all over Northern California. And so I was really worried 
about going and talking to people in Hayfork about prescribed fire, not only because of kind of my understanding of the perception of fire in Hayfork based on my own experience and my own nightmares about dry lightning and about um, wildfire as a kid, but also because now we have these huge wildfires going and people were having some really negative experiences in Hayfork that summer um, associated with the, the fire suppression efforts. So I thought that all of that combined would really um, put a damper on the responses I was getting from community members. But I was really surprised to find that um, most people I interviewed in Hayfork, and I interviewed 25 different people that represented all this kind of whole spectrum of the community, there was a really strong support for the role of fire in local forests. The interesting part was that it was all about who was doing the prescribed fire. And um, I think the big lesson that I got out of that study was, you know, people, people do know that fire is a part of the ecosystem generally, but, um, but trust is everything. And if people don't trust the people who are doing it, and if there's not trust between, in this case, the Forest Service and the people in the community, you're not gonna get anything done. Decades of effective fire suppression have left residents expecting smoke-free summer skies. Recent large fires have strained relations between fire managers and smoke-impacted communities. I would say that to have some expectation that the government or any other entity is going to keep the air pristine and free of particulate matter in a fire adapted, fire uh, resilient, uh, even fire dependent ecosystem is, is pretty naive to think that you can live in such an ecosystem and not have smoke at times. But at the same time, it's a very fair to say that in the wake of the 2008 season where there were such profound smoke impacts that the public's gonna be less tolerant of that for some period of time after an event like that. Extensive public outreach is key to successful burns. Community meetings, press releases, postings on notice boards, and special outreach to smoke-sensitive residents are all critical for maintaining public support for controlled burning. You have to kind of do things like switch or alternate watersheds or airsheds where you burn. Uh, just try to give people relief and not hit them year after year. The California Air Resources Board and their regional air quality management districts are charged with keeping the air clean for the state's residents. Through Title 17 of California state law, prescribed burning is treated as a nuisance to be regulated, often pitting air quality management districts against prescribed burn managers. What I've found is that it's important to work with our air quality management district and not necessarily treat them as an uh, adversary in this. I have to say that they have, have been very conducive and understanding of what we're trying to do out here. Um, examples of that are they've given discounts to uh, the people buying permits that are part of our burn program. We involve them early in the burn season. We show them what we're trying to do that year and we work together to figure out how to get those burns done. On several occasions we've been able to burn on no burn days because this was our last good burn window before the end of the grant period. Of course, you know, under EPA regulations and state regulations, wildfires are uh, pretty much exempt from smoke regulation. And this is one of the reasons, I think, that people are going more to uh, this unplanned ignition kind of issue because if you burn an acre from a, a lightning-caused fire, uh, as an agency, you're not liable for the smoke that emanates from that. You know, and I've been down here in the Klamath because I'll come hell or high water. And I've lived through some tremendous smoke episodes. And uh, I can understand why the locals don't like it. But one of the ways out of that is to think about prescribed fire in the off seasons of the year. And you're not going to be burning up a couple hundred thousand acres at one time. You're going to have limited impacts on the smoke resource. The Western Regional Air Partnership published guidance in 2005 to define natural versus man-made smoke emissions. The partnership classified Native American cultural burning and prescribed burning as natural emission sources. In addition to smoke regulations, 
Some regulatory agencies see climate change and the need to sequester carbon as another reason to limit prescribed fire. I think it's really important that uh, we don't hamstring uh, forest managers uh, by saying that because of climate change you can't use fire as a management tool. Uh, these systems are going to burn eventually, especially as we see more dry periods and more wet periods and the, this oscillation between the two off into the future and overall warmer temperatures. We're going to see um, a much higher frequency of large fires on the landscape. And so steps we can take now to restore fires a process in these systems will really pay dividends off into the future. They will emit some carbon, but the, the benefit is over the long haul that uh, we'll have uh, intact forests that'll continue to sequester that carbon. Despite challenges, communities across the North State are beginning to establish a relationship with controlled fire as a valuable management tool. As a community, we've seen the acceptance of prescribed burning around homes and, and in, in the wildland urban interface uh, increase over time through having successful burns that haven't gotten away uh, and not getting complaints and, and everything. But ultimately, we're gonna measure our success by how many people in our community own a drip torch and know how to use it. It links back to the prescribed fire council is having folks to look around and say, wow, all these people here are taking the same, or you know, seeing this challenge and are trying to face it. And knowing that you're not alone doing these things, I think is really helpful. The mission of the council is to provide a forum for all the different federal and state agencies and tribes and researchers and different stakeholders who use prescribed fire or are interested in prescribed fire to come together and collaborate to really protect, conserve, and expand the use of prescribed fire. Burners in California certainly are, have been ostracized uh, by the larger land management community and, and to some degree by society. That's an important thing to do to give people a sense of um, that what they're doing is important and okay. And okay. So that was part of it. Another reason to, to focus on it was to give peer education. Because these folks have been ostracized and the, the art and science of prescribed burning uh, is something that's not been focused on enough in the, in the region, it was an area that we could focus science delivery on those issues. We also focus on communication and on improving training and research around prescribed fire. And then the longer term goal uh, to change policy in California, to change policy so that um, to facilitate prescribed fire, to facilitate fire as a restoration tool, to facilitate fire as a biodiversity management tool, um, and a fuel reduction, uh, fire hazard reduction tool. It's a ground up approach. Um, and I think having people in the agencies all talking about prescribed fire, uh, subtly or not, um, I think that also affects policy change. Just a couple months ago, uh, a national cohesive strategy for managing wildfire was uh, uh, accepted by the federal government and that is almost revolutionary in scope because what it involves is integrative management across all jurisdictions so now it's not just public lands but private lands too have to be included in holistically thinking about planning managing fire the trouble is is one thing to have good policy on paper and another thing to put it in practice on the ground so that's still lots of work to be done you have to get uh, buy-in from a really disparate group of people with really a wide variety of values, and it's hard to do that. I don't see it as, a, as an issue that should divide us anymore. It's an issue that um, we all have in common, no matter, no matter who we are. Fuels treatments over the past 15 years by the Karuk Tribe and Orleans Soames Bar Fire Safe Council have been implemented in preparation for bringing back the ceremonial use of fire on Offield Mountain. The stage has been set for this to occur through a recently signed Memorandum of Understanding between the Forest Service and the tribe. When we're looking at success and we're looking at um, rebuilding the trust that is going to lead to the types of management actions that are going to restore our historic fire regimes, that all of us 
working together, the community, the Forest Service, the Kruk tribe, working together to get fire on Offield Mountain through the, the ceremonial burns that once happened there. Um, it's gonna be a powerful moment. So I think that there is a way that we can demonstrate fire adapted communities implementing actions that restore and maintain fire resilient landscapes while being available to respond to fire by establishing a demonstration landscape in, a, in an area that's that's of vital importance to the Kudug tribe as far as reinstatement of ceremonial burning practice. And it's individuals who are going to change the current paradigm that we find ourselves in. It's gonna be efforts of, you know, small groups of people working together to, to, to affect the whole. Expanding prescribed burning in the complex fire environments of Northern California will require a concerted effort from many diverse stakeholders. It will require communicating a unified vision for restoring fire-adapted ecosystems. It will require promoting skills and experience in the next generation of fire managers. One thing is clear, fire will always be a part of life in Northern California. But our relationship to fire is at a critical juncture. Will we continue to fight wildfires at any cost? Or will we learn to bring back fire on our own terms and begin to recreate the fire-resilient forests of a century ago? Bye. 